<clears throat> Welcome guys, uh, today I'm going to be uh, reacting to a video, let's see when it was posted, January 6th, uh, 2022. Uh, I don't know if you guys are uh, aware, but there's been a lot of turmoil in Kazakhstan lately, and I, I've really been curious about it, but there, there hasn't been any videos made online regarding what's been going on. And I think this video um, goes over uh, in details you know the situation in Kazakhstan right about now uh, and you know it's very dramatic you know the end of Kazakhstan I don't know if that's true or false I'm curious uh, anyways guys let's go in leave a like and all that hi Peter Zion here sorry I'm a little out of sorts I was woken up early because of breaking news in Kazakhstan unfortunately it also snowed last night so I just came in from shoveling anyway Kazakhstan has gone from a backwater that no one's ever heard of or cares about to suddenly the news. We've got protests there that are over, trying to overthrow the government. Uh, in fact, the government was dissolved by the president earlier in the week. The presidential palace is on fire. There are protests in every major city. Uh, the Russians have already deployed paratroopers. Supposedly there are hundreds dead. And we really don't know about the details. This has always been an authoritarian area. This has always been an authoritarian government. And media presence has always been thin. There's always been information blackouts. And now with the internet being shut down across the entire country, we really just don't know. Mm. Before we go into why Kazakhstan matters, it would probably be best if we first talked about what is a Kazakhstan. Well, One of the reasons uh, why I believe uh, Kazakhstan matters so much, and this could be a potential I don't think it's gonna devolve into a disaster uh, to the proportions of I don't know I don't think about it I don't have an example what do you know what I mean like a disaster like a turmoil like Syria for example I don't think that's gonna happen because Kazakhstan and a bunch of other countries are within the basically the NATO of Russia if you will it's called the CSTO uh, and uh, it's a military alliance basically and Russia is the most powerful member, but and that's one of the reasons why Russian troops, paratroopers, were sort of dropped on Kazakhstan because normal, otherwise, you know, it's a sovereign nation. Why would Russia just come in? It's because of that treaty. Um, uh, but one of the reasons why Kazakhstan will be so important is because it's going to connect China to Russia and the West through their Belt and Road Initiative that passes through Kazakhstan. Um, and so this could be a major blow uh, to, at least, I don't think it's going to be a major blow to the Belt and Road Initiative in the long term, but it will be definitely, you know, a challenge in the, in the short term. We'll see where it goes. Well, let's start with location. Kazakhstan is a Central Asian state. So if you hadn't heard of it before or don't know much about it, you should not berate yourself because it is literally at the intersection of no and where yeah it is it's a huge roughly country. the size of alaska plus texas plus montana put together yeah, it's but it has a population of only about 18 million making it one of the least po densely populated places on the world yeah. and normally you know this is not something that would really matter to anyone unless of course you are russian the Ukraine situation is getting all the attention but in many ways what's going on in Kazakhstan is actually more important to Moscow. Take a look at this population density map from my most recent book Disunited Nations. Uh, you can see how Russia is, well to be perfectly blunt, empty in most places. You've got that kind of V chunk of territory starting in Europe and moving south into Siberia, I'm sorry moving east into Siberia, where almost everybody lives. That's the warmest part of the country. You go south of that, it gets too arid. You get north of that, it gets too cold. Uh, Kazakhstan, you'll notice, is largely empty. But in the northern section of Kazakhstan, you will notice where the arrow is, that there is some population bleed over from Russia. That area is predominantly populated by ethnic Russians, or there are Russians on the north side of the border that migrate into Kazakhstan for seasonal work. This is an area that Russia de facto controls. Now, the way that the Russians look at it is kind of like this. You know, more traditional map, population centers in the northwest, in the north, and on the south. You'll notice that the major cities are all in the south. 
the major population centers, uh, the major population density regions, and then there's a whole lot of empty in the middle. Now the protests most recently started here in the Northwest. It was originally an issue about fuel prices, but this is an authoritarian era with a corrupt government and there's a lot of dissatisfaction. So just like in every other post-Soviet state and a lot of the developing world, uh, a lot of times you will see protests explode because of something that didn't seem all that important in the first place. You could argue that that is the story of Black Lives Matter in the United States as well. One incident can release a lot of tension. Now, the protests have spread to be nationwide. Down here is the city of Almaty, and it is by far the largest city in the country. Uh, the city there is now under lockdown. That's where most of the people are believed to have been killed. But we also have significant protests going on in Astana, which is their artificial capital. Uh, a decision was made in the early post-Soviet period that Almaty, which had been the capital during Soviet times, was too close to China, so they moved it 1,500 miles north. You know, while you know the Soviet Union fell apart and you think, well, we're going to give them democracy and it's going to be better for everybody, when you think about it, which country turned out better? Uh, I mean, it, it helped, of course, the West tremendously with the collapse of the Soviet Union because they lost a lot of international influence and power and wealth. But I'm talking inside the Soviet Union. Which country truly benefited from their collapse? Like, not only, but the people. Like, who benefited the most? Nobody. I mean, which country is truly democratic that was a former Soviet Republic? You might say Ukraine, but Ukraine, uh, the new president was installed because of, because of a coup supported by the West. So, is that a democracy? I don't think so. Or at least, it's a democracy that's favorable to the West, so, I don't know. Uh, Kazakhstan and, you know, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, Kyrgyzstan, they're all basically dictatorships. Uh, Maybe, maybe uh, you, I might be ignorant here, so in the comments you might say, oh, maybe this one country that I've mentioned is under the dictatorship. I don't know, I'm just putting everything in a swath. Um, you know, it's, when you think about, what other countries are there? Uh, Belarus, the last dictator in Europe, I mean, it's, it's a mess. Uh, Astana is, uh, all, by all accounts, a horrible, horrible place to live and completely artificial. Uh, it has some of the most cl extreme climatic variations in the world, uh, regularly topping 100 degrees in the summer and negative 40 degrees in the winter. It's not the kind of place that anyone would want to live, but protests are going on here as well. We know that the presidential palace has been burned down and a lot of government buildings have been Whoa, sacked. Whoa, what? Now, the when the Russians look burned? at this, the northern population centers are ones that are like, okay, these border Russia, these are things we can control. But the southern population centers are a problem. Yeah. Why? Let's zoom out just a little bit and look at Central Asia as a whole. This is including all the other former Soviet republics in the region. Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, and Kyrgyzstan. Other countries that you probably haven't heard a lot about. You'll notice that all the population density is really further south. And the population density in South Kazakhstan is just the beginning of the story, not the end. Yeah. The Russian fear is that that big swath of open in Kazakhstan is something that cannot be defended against. And since the Russian population is in terminal demographic decline, but the population growth rates in the Central Asian republics are rising, the Russians see this region as a whole as a security threat in and of itself and as a potential avenue for Islamic fundamentalism to come up from places like Afghanistan and Pakistan. That's a good point. So in the ideal Russian situation, all of these populations would be locked down so that they cannot cause problems for the Russians. They'd be put into completely tough totalitarian systems that would squash any dissent, shoot anyone who causes any problems. That is kind of the Russian goal here, and preferably to do so with Russian assistance. And in the case of Kazakhstan, the Russians pretty much have that locked up. Kazakhstan is not nearly as functional as Ukraine. It really had never started its post-Soviet transition, whether that was gonna go into totalitarianism or to democracy. Civil society is very, very thin. And the leader 
of Kazakhstan is a guy by the name of Nursultan Nazarbayev, and he was in charge of Kazakhstan during the Soviet times. I mean, this yeah. guy has been around almost as long as Biden. He is by far one of the most uh, corrupt world leaders, far more so than Putin, far more so than the leaders in most of the rest of You know, I believe that it's much easier to be corrupt, to be extremely corrupt in a small, excuse me for this, but insignificant, insignificant country because there are less eyeballs on you. Because if you're the biggest dictator in the world in a no-name country in the middle of nowhere, that there's never news about it unless you know what happens here in Kazakhstan with the revolts when was the last time before this anybody has heard about Kazakhstan never I mean unless you've played uh, some you know Hearts of Iron 4 or even then you you know if you know your geography you know the country exists but you don't know what's going on inside of it truly unless you're a journalist or you're interested you have family but um it's a, you know it's it's its own thing man it, that's why you know you think putin is the biggest uh, dictator in the world and the, this you know me megalomaniac who has all this wealth squandered away but th there's so many eyeballs on him that he he cannot be outright a hundred percent horrible you know what i mean uh, uh whereas you know kazakhstan tajikistan kyrgyzstan Afghanistan, you know what I mean? Those countries that, and you exp you can expand it to other countries as well. I'm not trying to just stay in that area, but to the former Soviet space. I mean, honestly, Turkmenistan is really kind of the only one that might even be remotely in his league. Uh, remember that capital was moved, Astana. Uh, its real name, legal name now, is Nursultan. His first name. <laughs> uh, he basically owns the city. He owns oh. the airline that flies in and out of the city. He's basically looted this country as much as he possibly can. He's now in his early 80s, and he's not technically president anymore, but he's still calling all the shots, especially now. Uh, he actually argued against the dissolution of the Soviet Union back in the late 1980s because he didn't think Kazakhstan could make it a go of it as an independent country. He's probably right. And so he's always remained very tightly aligned with the Kremlin. And so as soon as these protests started, he and his government started shouting that it was all about foreign uh, instigators making it happen. And I know, like American intelligence is competent enough to start three different rebellions in a country in the middle of nowhere. I'm sorry. Uh, where was I going with this? Well, you know, American intelligence, I don't know if he's trying to be funny, but I, I, I'm pretty sure they're, they're competent enough to do it. Because it doesn't take that much to start three rebellions. You start one, you give ideas to the people, and they can do their own. Uh, you know, they can... <sighs> Listen, either... This is going to be a huge coup for the, Amer for the West. I don't want to say the Americans, just the West. Because it's going to uh, bug down the Russians and the Chinese. It's going to be a problem they have to deal with. So if the Americans did it uh, intentionally, good for them. I mean, they did an amazing job to create a problem for their uh, potential enemies. If it was a block of the draw, something out of that came out of nowhere, they got lucky, I guess. But I don't, I don't. Yeah, it's I don't know. Uh, the point being is that he, the Russians have always seen Kazakhstan as tilting towards them. And now that Nursultan Nazarbayev has actually invited the Russians to deploy troops, oh boy, are they. It took less than a day for the first paratroopers to arrive. We now have an undisclosed number of peacekeepers coming from Russia, and the Russians are probably going to get exactly what it is that they've always been after, a forward troop presence in multiple places in Kazakhstan, hard up on the southern borders, and a country that is now under complete political lockdown. So barring significant and honestly very unexpected international action on this situation, no, 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 no. Kazakhstan is about to become at best a satellite state like Armenia. Yeah, the, uh, the, what happened in the, you know, the, the support that the West has for the Ukraine, which to be honest, my opinion on it is I don't think they should join NATO at all. But also, the, I think this should become, you know, uh, I heard this from, I don't know, a YouTuber talking about it, and I agree with his point of view, which is Ukraine should become a neutral country, like Switzerland. 
they shouldn't go towards the West. They shouldn't go towards the just say neutral, and you know it will be better for everybody. But um, even from the, for themselves in general. But I don't think it's gonna happen because you know they lost Crimea. It's they think it's theirs, and in many ways it is. Um, anywho, we're getting off topic. Where was I talking about? Um, yeah, nobody will care about about the country in the middle of nowhere, Kazakhstan. Are you kidding me, bro? Yeah, Ukraine is close to Europe. Okay, there are many Europe Europeans who know Ukrainians, who know the history of Ukraine, who know about you know the Great Famine and the First the Second World War and the history. Kazakhstan, in the middle of nowhere, above Afghanistan, nowhere, nowhere. For Belarus, uh, its days of being functionally independent or even nominally independent are pretty much over. Now, why does that matter to anyone who's outside of Kazakhstan? Well, there's a couple of market things. Number one, uranium. This is the world's largest uranium producer. Uh, that's not as important as it sounds. There's a lot of uranium in a lot of other places, Australia, and Russia, and um, Canada come to mind. So I'm really not worried about any sort of shortage here. Also, the Americans are still spinning down their nuclear warheads from the Cold War, so there's still several years of supply left there. There might be some tightness in the market, but nothing that can't be adjusted to in a year or three, even if Kazakh uranium falls off the market, but Kazakh uranium is not produced where the people are. So as long as there are trade relations, I really don't see anything going on there. The bigger problem is oil. Now, in the late Soviet period, under Gorbachev, the Russians, the Soviets, started to loosen up a little bit and invite a few countries to come in and help them with their energy sector. Kazakhstan is where they ended up going because there were some projects there that the Soviets lacked the technical skills to attack, specifically in the northwestern part of the country near the Caspian Sea. Now, 30 years later, you still have Western companies involved, and Kazakhstan is kicking out over a million barrels a day of crude for export, almost exclusively from this region. If Kazakhstan becomes a satellite state of Russia, it's very, very likely, because we have a crackdown that's killing hundreds of people already, it's very, very likely that Kazakhstan is going to be lumped in with the Russians when it comes to sanctions on everything that the Kremlin is doing around the world. And when that happens, you can say goodbye to companies like Exxon or Chevron being involved in Kazakhstan in the first place. So these projects will probably die because the Russians cannot run them without the foreigners and the Chinese lack the technical skills. What? That will obviously result in several hundred thousand barrels a day being removed from... What? Seriously? The Chinese? Like maybe the Russians lack that skills somehow, like 30 years later, they still haven't learned. Okay. But Chinese lack the skills? What's this? The trade secrets of the West? <laughs> what the hell is going on? Are you kidding me? Like, only Western companies know how to extract oil? What? From the market. That's where we are right now. For longer term outcomes, you need to go back to this map. Because remember, the most densely part, populated part of this region isn't Kazakhstan. It's further south in Uzbekistan. Now, the Uzbeks are rapidly anti-Russian, and they're not all that fond of any of their neighbors in the first place. They see themselves as the natural leaders of this region, and they have been counting upon that big, empty space in Kazakhstan to keep the Russians beyond their horizon. That's not going to be possible anymore. Yeah. Now, Uzbekistan is a country with a population roughly twice the size of Kazakhstan. It probably has the second most functional military in the former Soviet space. And because of that insulation from know that. the Russian territories... They've kind of been able to run things on their own. Every time there's some sort of coup in a place like Kyrgyzstan or Tajikistan or Turkmenistan or a leader dies, the Uzbeks have tried to move in the role and they find themselves blocked by the Russians because the Turkmen, the Kyrgyz, the Tajiks dislike the Uzbeks. But now that you're going to have Russian troops in a very big way in Kazakhstan dictating the region's security environment, the Uzbeks are going to have to either put up or shut up. So we are either going to see rising geopolitical tensions in this region, which will shatter the energy matrix, that the natural gas that comes out of Turkmenistan going to China, the stuff that comes out of Kazakhstan that's going to China, you know, all that is under threat now. Or the Uzbeks are going to have to sue for peace. Considering that we now have two strongly authoritarian governments that are leering at each other over a very narrow chunk of territory, I would expect this part of the world to get more interesting rather than less for the next few years. But it also means that the Russians are now 
facing down opponents in Kazakhstan, in Ukraine, and the Baltics, and Belarus, the Russians are now actively engaged in geopolitical contexts that are turning hot on almost all of their borders. We're going to find out very soon just what Russia's capacity it is to engage on this sort of scale. The Soviets went out of their way to not face this many foes down at the same time. So now point. Russia's doing a bigger carry with fewer resources. This is going to get lively very soon. All right, guys, I hope you liked the, this reaction. This was a great video. I've never heard of this channel. Great, very informative. Um, and yeah, it's going to be very interesting in the future, Kazakhstan and all that. Um, tell me, guys, what you guys think in the comments of my reaction, of my thoughts, and on this video. It was very, very, very good. I really enjoyed it. Um, go check this channel. Uh, I've never heard of it. Incredible channel. I, I learned a lot. Uh, and yeah, we'll see if Russia will be able to, you know, handle... Uh, conflicts on three fronts and uh, see you guys next time see you guys